Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be your master of ceremony for this leveraging local level resilient session at 2021 European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction. In this session, we'll like to discuss new approaches to protect the most vulnerable and empower all people to make informed decisions, enhancing resilience and reduce, reducing vulnerabilities. The identification of challenges and opportunities of local governments to implement strategies and actions to building resilience and strengthening the resilience against so-called climate-driven disasters and by building resilience also contribute to the climate change adaption efforts. Today is also the day to celebrate local level resilience and the exchange we have among cities and partners within the Making Cities Resilience 2013 initiative. To tell you a bit more about that, I'd like to Im invite Mr. Wolfgang Teubner, Re Regional Director of ICLE Europe. Wolfgang, Thank the you, floor Madam is Mayor. yours. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody to this to this session and to the introduction of the Making Cities Resilience campaign. Let's face it, I mean, we live in a very challenging period of time where we see millions of people have been dying because of COVID-19 and maybe around 100 million people have been pushed back in poverty. And this is... Uh, particularly affecting, of course, cities, because we live also in a time of urbanization where still people are moving into our cities and the cities are growing and are especially exposed to the risks that we are, that we are facing. And definitely not to forget about climate change that is both leading to more events and uh, more serious impacts. So we need, of course, to put our focus on protecting our people that are vulnerable to, and exposed to these catastrophic events, to secure their health, but also to secure a sustainable and good life for them. When many years ago, in response also, of course, to the uh, Sendai framework, the Making Cities Resilience campaign was starting. We managed over a period of time to mobilize more than 4,300 cities that got engaged in the campaign. However, looking at the scale of challenges and also looking at the number of cities around the world, this is of course by far not enough. And that is why we have decided to join UNDR in its efforts to scale this up, but not only to broaden and in the, the campaign and to increase the numbers, but also to enhance its impact, its support for these cities and to engage cities in a peer learning, peer exchange, and also to provide technical support and information for them on their path to become more resilient. So the Making Cities Resilience campaign is, of course, uh, not only a joint effort of UNDRR and, and ICLE as the co-chair for Europe and Central Asia, but it's also, of course, supported by many other partners like the WHO, the Global Resilience Network, and uh, as we learned today, also UNDP is joining our efforts and of course many more that are not mentioned here today, but what, which we are happy to have on board. However, no initiative, no campaign would get anywhere without its champions, without those that are creating 
good practice that are showcasing what needs to be done and have successfully implemented in it. So the champions that we need that lead the others that are ready and willing to get engaged, to exchange their experience, to take others along, to learn from them, to support them, and to, to guide them on their path to a more resilient development. This needs both. We need better responses to emergencies. We need better reactions, but also we need more foresight more diligent planning and more prevention of catastrophic events because we know reaction a good reaction is good the prevention is always better before something is happening and affecting people and it's also ultimately better to invest in prevention than investing in recovery and that's what we also experiencing now that we are basically in a permanent you know wave after wave you know we think we are over it and then we get back because we are most likely not yet good enough in prevention so as you those of you who have been at the lunch ceremony have already basically get to know our highly estimated first champions our first four resilient hubs, and it's a pleasure for me, also on behalf of UNDRR and ICLE as the co-chair, to introduce our first four resilience hubs, which are the city of Milan, the city of Manchester, the city of Barcelona, and the city of Helsingborg in Sweden. Thank you very much for the to, to big thank you to those cities for getting engaged and putting their application forward. And now I ask please to play the video. Em fa molta il·lusió anunciar que Barcelona ha estat escollida Resilient Hub per part de Nacions Unides dins del programa Making City Resilient al 2030. Un projecte que, que reforça una de les idees que des de la ciutat de Barcelona venim treballant des de fa molt de temps. Som plenament conscients que, que com a éssers humans, que com a persones, som vulnerables. I per tant, eh, sabem que en diferents moments de la nostra vida eh, tenim no, dependència, tenim situacions de vulnerabilitat i això fa que necessitem tirar endavant propostes que mirin molt bé com adaptem la nostra ciutat a aquesta vulnerabilitat, com pensem fer una ciutat per tothom. Això és una reflexió que des de l'ecofeminisme es ve desenvolupant des de fa molt de temps, des de les cures, des del treball també amb les infraestructures, amb la planificació urbana. I per tant, per nosaltres a Barcelona és un treball indispensable. Com planifiquem les grans estructures de la infraestructura, des de la perspectiva de la vulnerabilitat, des de la perspectiva dels serveis, de com pensem l'aigua, de com pensem l'energia. Totes aquestes actuacions Barcelona les porta desenvolupant des de fa molt de temps. Però, evidentment, avui ens han estat molt útils, per exemple, per fer front a la situació de Covid que hem patit o, per exemple, també per donar resposta a l'emergència climàtica que encara també patim i que seguirem patint. Per tant, aquest projecte, aquesta, aquesta designació com a, com a hub de la resiliència a nivell internacional no només ens reconeix no, tota la feina feta, sinó que ens anima a seguir treballant per seguir fent de Barcelona una ciutat referent en salut no? i, sobretot, també una ciutat referent en sostenibilitat. Per tant, seguirem treballant per fer-ho possible. Hi, my name is Andy Burnham, and I'm the Mayor of Greater Manchester in the UK. And on behalf of everybody in our city region, can I say how honoured we are to be recognised as a resilience hub by the United Nations and to have the opportunity to contribute to making cities resilient 2030. We are the first city in the UK to have this recognition, and we are very proud of it, and we intend to make sure we make a full contribution. This feels like the right time to come together, work together to address common challenges as we all look to the effects of the pandemic, but look ahead actually to the challenges posed by climate change. Now more than ever before, it feels as though cities around the world need to forge strong bonds and make that commitment to work together 
and this network that's being created will enable us to do that. We recognize the need to strengthen our own resilience, having faced a devastating terrorist attack in recent years, but also seen the consequences of flooding and moorland fires. We know that the future will continue to pose big challenges for our city region. So we have established a cross-sector partnership with Greater Manchester Resilience Forum. We have appointed a Chief Resilience Officer and we have brought forward our own Greater Manchester Resilience Strategy. So we are doing a lot, but we're never a place that feels we can't learn from others around the world. And we feel as being part of this network, we can work with our partner cities and regions around the world to share best practice and hear about what others are doing so that we can all strengthen each other's plans together. So as we look to build back from the pandemic, this city region wants to build back stronger, but also fairer. We want to be a city region that narrows inequality, that achieves climate justice as well as social justice. That's what we are all about here in Greater Manchester in the coming time. And we look forward to working with our colleagues at the United Nations and cities around the world in making it a reality. I'm honored to receive the announcement of Milan becoming a new resilient hub within the Making Cities Resilient 2030 program of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. For years, Milan has been active in a process of environmental transition that puts citizens at the center of our space. We are working to return open and green spaces to the citizenship. Citizens are involved in a participatory process to design spaces and services for a city well-being, inclusiveness, and security are central. The COVID-19 pandemic has delayed this process only apparently. In practice, it has shown that the system we live in is not sustainable at all. We must find a new way to live and experience cities. And adaptation measures to current and future risks must go along with mitigation measures. Now, becoming a resilient hub gives us the opportunity to learn from other cities that, like Milan, look for innovative solutions to complex problems. We cannot think of acting alone to address the global challenges we face. Cities are the first to actively respond to the systemic crisis. Therefore, dialogue, exchange and cooperation between cities is the starting point to trigger the change. Milan is eager to start our journey as a resilient partner, contributing to the dialogue that will guide us through this era of transition. Thank you. Like many other cities, Helsingborg is facing great challenges. And to meet these challenges, we need to work together. In this journey, it's a great honor for us to be recognized alongside Barcelona, Milan, and Greater Manchester as a resilient hub by the United Nations. Successful disaster risk reduction takes time and requires perseverance, resources, and commitment. And we can partly or completely prevent certain disasters, but far from all. In Helsingborg, we are proud of our disaster risk governance. Several evaluations carried out by the city during the pandemic have shown that we are on the right track. How we have chosen to approach disaster risk governance at the local level is something we believe can inspire other members. MCR 2030 will allow us to share our experiences in this and several other areas. And we are equally excited to learn from the experience of others in order to make Helsingborg a more resilient city and thereby creating conditions for the safe, sustainable and smart city of the future. I think they need, they deserve us. Thank you, congratulations to the four resilient hubs and thank you, Mrs. Mr. Teubner, for your presentation. I'd like also to present you the other members of the table, Mrs. 
Zenav Kozevic, the head of the Civil Protection Operation Center of the Central Bosnia Canton, and uh, Luis Ramal Carvalho from the Civil Protection Service of Amadora. It's a pleasure to receive you here. And before going further, I'd like you also to leave you with some words about our own protest service here in Matuzinhos, just to tell you that Matuzinhos, as a resilient city, has been working on the development of resilience in the community by focusing on awareness activities carried out with children and young people about the greatest risks and day-to-day -day risks, but also all this work is done with the elderly and people with disabilities. This work that we have been developing since, has been developed since 2008. And this year we created also a little house that we call House of Alerting, is a nickname that only Portuguese can understand. That is a place where the entire community can learn about the risks of everyday life in a space that is similar as a real house, where we simulate the risks and visitors identify and correct them. Also, we focus on the Baywatch rescue system, which is a unique system in the country that is able 365 days a year, whose missions are to rescue people in the danger at the sea, help in the sand, monitor coast overthrowing and raise awareness of all those who seek the beaches of Matuzinhos on their specific risks. Since the service started working in 2012, more than 300 people have been saved in our beaches at the sea. Another important issue is the incident management platform, a system where we bring together all the firefighters and the civil protection in a platform that allows operational and political decision makers to have the important operational information at, on time on their digital and mob, on mobile devices, thus knowing the panorama of Matuzinhos and then be able to decide with all this information available in the geographic information system of the municipality. With this system, the entire intervention of the firefighters and civil protection picked is accessible to the decision makers. And despite the reduced forest area, the impact of our work on protecting and preserving the Matuzinhos forest has reduced forest fires to less than two fires per year. And the cleaning of land, awareness of the owners and proximity to the population has allowed for forest management that has shown excellent results. And these are always only a few examples of the work that we are doing and we are, don't want to be talking a long time about ourselves. We just want to leave you with our commitment that we want to be a resilience hub and that we are already working on it and that we are going to keep on working in order to achieve this goal. But now we should continue. So it's time for me to, put a que to use a question to Mr. Amirkan Kurban Koda, first deputy mayor of Durshar in Kazakhstan. I believe it's, I, can I do it? Is it? It is already ready. So Mr. Deputy Mayor, at MCR 2030, we are keen on learning from different experiences. Recently, the Shen has done a resilient assessment. Can you tell us more about what the city is learning about these hazards and how you're tracking them? Please, Mr. Уважаемые за организацией проведения данного форума. В начале от имени 
исполнительного органа государственной власти города Душанбе хочу выразить признательность Управлению Организации Объединенных Наций по снижению риска бедствий за активные сотрудничество во имя развития и устойчивости города Душанбе. По предложению Управления Организации Объединенных Наций по снижению риска бедствий о сотрудничестве и поддержке разработки плана оповещения устойчивости города исполнительный орган государственной власти город Душанбе начал работу в этом направлении в июле 2021 года. Город Душанбе официально присоединился к глобальной инициативе по решению устойчивости городов 2030 Присоединившись к глобальной сети городов мира, город Душанбе продемонстрировал приверженность принятию мер по обеспечению безопасности и благополучия граждан при бедствиях и кризисах. Мы разделяем мнение о том, что повышение устойчивости городов 2030 — это уникальная инициатива для всех заинтересованных сторон по повышению устойчивости на местном уровне посредством информационного пропагандистской, технической знаний, подключения нескольких уровней правительства и налаживания партнерских отношений. Город Душанбе начал проведение оценки устойчивости к бедствиям с целью разработки проекта стратегии и плана действия по укреплению устойчивости города к бедствиям. Для этого по поручению руководства города Создана техническая рабочая группа из числа представителей соответствующих структур города. В августе текущего года исполнительный орган государства и власти города Шамби совместно с Управлением Организации Объединенных Наций по снижению риска бедствий организовали первые семинары для обсуждения и проведения оценки устойчивости города по двум оценочным листам. Да оценочный лист системы здравоохранения, предварительная и вторая предварительная оценка устойчивости к пенсии. В этом контексте необходимо отметить, что город Душанбе и раньше постоянно занимался вопросами обеспечения устойчивости, реализуя различные проекты. Но начало работы по оценке показало, что это хорошая возможность сознать, создать полную картину о ситуации в городе и имеющейся потенциале. По результатам первых семинаров мы пришли к выводу, что необходимо собрать более детальную информацию по всем направлениям для того, чтобы не упустить какие-либо особенности и оценить все имеющиеся возможности и сферы, которые необходимо усилить. В этой связи мы решили продолжить эту работу и собрать информацию о соответствующих структурах. То есть в этом плане мы будем уже опираться на мнение не только одного специалиста, а на достоверную информацию от ответственного ведомства. Данный метод был выработан во время семинаров самими участниками. На наш взгляд, это эффективный подход. В этом процессе будут организованы индивидуальные консультации экспертов Управления Организации Объединенных Наций по снижению риска бедствий с ключевыми структурами. Хочу отметить, что в начале ноября мы имели возможность обсудить этот процесс и в целом нашей сотрудничества при встрече с господином Биволом, главой регионального опыта управления организацией объединенных наций по снижению риска бедствий по Европе и Центральной Азии в ходе его визита в город Шамбе. Мы намерены собрать результаты этих двух оценок в начале следующего года и перейти к процессу детальной оценки. Уважаемые участники форума, местные органы власти, 
первым сталкивается с последствиями стихийной бедствия и является ключевым участником цикла управления риском стихийной бедствия. Создание устойчивых городов означает принятие упреждающих мер, основанных на анализе и планировании, которые направлены на предотвращение риска, а также овладение гибкими и динамичными методами подготовки, реагирования и восстановления после стихийных бедствий. Мы надеемся, что процесс проведения оценки и выработки стратегии и плана действий по укреплению устойчивости родов будут способствовать этим задачам. В контексте, в контексте участия в глобальной инициативе повышения устойчивости родов 2030 мы заинтересованы с налаживанием сотрудничества с другими городами и партнерами по реализации проектов по снижению риска бедствий и укреплению устойчивости города. Мы бы хотели поднять вопрос об организации площадки в рамках данной инициативы для обмена опытом и привлечения заинтересованных сторон в осуществлении проекта. Нам интересно узнать опыт других городов и возможности привлечения интересов в проекты на взаимовыгодной основе. Приражаем уверенность в том, что данный форум будет способствовать дальнейшему сотрудничеству между исполнительным органом государства и власти города Шамбе и управлением Организации Объединенных Наций по снижению риска бедствий а также расширение и укрепление сотрудничества с другими городами мира и заинтересованными партнерами. Желаю всем участникам и организаторам форума успешного проведения данного мероприятия и блага всестороннего развития городов, в том числе и в Шамбе. Спасибо. Thank you, Mr. Senior Urban Zoda, for your participation and representation of the city of Dushanbe. It was very important to hear your testimony. We now go further, and I'd like to pose a question to Ares Gavas, Chief Resilient Officer of Barcelona. Ares, first of all, congratulations to Barcelona on becoming a resilient uh, resilience hub. Barcelona has been one of the most innovative cities, reinventing itself and building resilience over the years. As a mayor myself, I'm eager to learn from your experience. Can you tell us how you intend to use role as a resilience hub within making cities resilient to support other cities? Thank you very much, Ms. Elena Salguero, also for welcoming us in the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction. We are very pleased to be able to take part in this session. And before answering to your question, if I may, I would like to take a moment to also thank you and DRR's Making Cities Resilience Initiative for the recognition of Barcelona as one of the first resilience hubs in, in Europe, together with Milan, Greater Manchester and Helsingborg. We are very keen on being part of, of this initiative. And answering to your question, I think Barcelona has undertaken quite a long resilience journey since 2009, when we started the implementation of risk reduction projects in the city's infrastructures and services, following a resilience logic. That is with a holistic and across sectorial approach, putting an effort in stakeholder engagement and proactive uh, risk reduction for pre pre prevention and preparedness in order to minimize vulnerabilities and the probability of occurrence and impact of critical events. And over the years, the growing demand to deal with other kinds of shocks and stresses that are at the same time growing in complexity, and the recent pandemic is a good example of that, and so is the climate emergency, they have required an un unprecedented response uh, of the local administration. And um, as you mentioned, we've needed to innovate and, and reinvent, reinvent ourselves. So over the last 10 years, our resilience model has been evolving in order to be responsive to these new challenges. 
And all this experience is that we we hope and, and what we have to offer and what we hope we will be able to share with uh, with other cities that may be uh, um, at more initial stages in, in the resilient journey so that they can benefit from, from our experience and from all what, what we've been able to learn through these years in the ways that uh, it can be more useful for them. And this can happen through city-to-city -city collaborations and peer-to-peer -peer support, as we've already been doing uh, in the past. But now um, it has a great potential of, of being amplified through the, through the HUBS initiatives. And on our side as well, we have also been benefited from, from this exchange. And the fact that we have joined uh, city networks, such as the Resilient Cities Network in 2015, and before that, UN Habitat's uh, City Resilience Rewards Program or the Making City Resilient uh, Initiative that we started collaborating uh, with in 2013. This has allowed us not only to share our working methodology, but it has also given us the opportunity to be in touch with a community of experts and the most innovative initiatives that are being implemented at a global scale, which is something that uh, has brought a great value for, for us. And also precisely because of this need that I was mentioning before to constantly reinvent ourselves, we also deem the role of these city networks and, progr of, and programs so valuable. They support us to broaden our perspective and they also open a window on the, the wall for us to connect with other cities and, and to be able to share knowledge and experiences and, uh, and learn from them while uh, allowing us to be in touch with this community of, of practice and, and experts that is extremely valuable for us. Thank you, Mrs. Gavas, for your participation. And I am now pleased to invite Mrs. Zanada Kauzevich. As I told you, she, uh, Mrs. Kauzevich is the head of the Civil Protection Operations Center of Central Bosnia, Canton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your hospitality. And uh, just to say that I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. And I'd like you, please, if you don't mind, to ask you if you can tell us how, about how the Canton supports cities in building local resilience and why do you think it's important for regional governments to get involved? Thank you. Well, recognizing the urgent need for climate change adoption measures, representatives of the Central Bosnia Canton have launched various projects and activities to strengthen the capability of local communities increase resilience and reduce the impact of disasters in our canton. The government of Central Bosnia Canton adopted the development strategy of uh, our canton 2021-2027 with three strategic goals, which are the basis for determining proprieties and measures, as well as the following steps in planned development of the canton. The first one, to encourage sustainable economic development, to improve the quality of life and sustainable social environment for all citizens, and to prove the state of the environment and public structure. Also, a cantonal administration for civil protection plans to develop a sectoral development strategy, the protection and rescue program of the Canton in period 2022-2027 and the update of uh, Canton vulnerability assessment to natural hazard and accompanying documents are underway. Now I will try to uh, say something more practical, what we have done so far. So, uh, Cantonal Civil Protection Administration regularly co finance municipal projects in the field of protection and rescue. In period from uh, 2014 to the end of 2020, the cantonal headquarters of civil protection, at the proposal of cantonal administration of civil protection, approved and forwarded to the government of our canton for adoption the amount of approximately 1.3 millions of euros for projects of preventive and rescue measures 
as well as for equipping and training civil protection forces and for uh, financial help in cases of uh, natural hazards we faced. From uh, 2015 to 2020, with the support of UNDP and the Global Fund, a project entitled Integrating Climate Change into Flood Risk Reduction in Verbas Valley Basin was launched. It included uh, some municip municipalities from Republic of Srpska, four municipalities from our canton, our cantonal department for civil uh, protection, and the uh, uh, Department for Civil Protection of Republic Srpska. During the project, the first set of non-structural measures was implemented through the implementation of 10 projects with the, uh, of 10 uh, projects. This year, we also continue with co uh, financing of uh, municipal projects because we really believe and uh, in a way experience had taught us that is much better to invest in preventive measures than to spend more funds on rehabilitation. Uh, also, <laughs> other uh, government institutions are involved uh, in activities that include uh, disaster risk reduction. Thus, for example, we have, I will mention only a few uh, projects. A project to, to strengthen public awareness of the importance of environmental protection, then uh, several projects on reconstruction or construction water supplies, uh, sewage system, uh, waste management, system, uh, management systems, etc. Or the, uh, our last uh, project uh, in cooperation with UNDP is the project of launching environmental financing of low carbon urban development energy efficiency. So, uh, our goals are to improve governments, institutional capacity in co uh, in, and cooperation in DRR policies, and in this regard, to increase infrastructure resilience, to strengthen uh, civil protection forces, and to improve the awareness of all relevant stakeholders and the public in general, because it's a uh, let's say, main problem in our canton about local risk, risks and vulnerabilities by straightening data, skills, knowledge, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Kauzovic, for your presentation, enthusias enthusiastic presentation. And I'd like now to ask to Mr. Luis Carvalho, a great partner in Armador, and asking you to send best regards to the mayor, Carla Tavares, which is a good friend from Matzinhos, and I invite you to join us in this discussion. And Luis, we know that you work closely with the National Platform of, for DRR in Portugal. And how do you think initiatives such as MCR 2030 can help strengthen vertical links between local and national governments? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for, for the invitation to be part of this panel. And it's always special to be here in Metuzings, as you know. Um, well, about your question, I think, uh, starting uh, for the major point, I think, um, in disaster risk reduction, as you know, uh, all linkage between international, national and local level are fundamental for the success of strategies. Um, currently, in our national platform for the AA, we have a working group on the resilient cities. Uh, where all uh, Portuguese cities from the campaign are represented. And on this working group that we have uh, on the national platform, we, we saw a lot of benefits. I can just highlight some of them. The, for example, the ability to share experience between the cities, uh, the training of local resources, uh, dissemination of good practice and development of local strategy and platform. So we have a meeting uh, even uh, for a semester with all the cities, and these are some examples of benefits that we have on the working group. And well, is, and this was achieved in the past, in, in the present, so with the support of the national level, that's all important for the activities of the working group and the promotion of the uh, several projects about resilience and DR. As you know, uh, Portugal has um, 30 cities on the, on the campaign. I think Portugal is the, 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 the 
in the Europe region is the, the country with many and more cities and uh, want just to achieve until 2023 20, 60 uh, cities on the campaign. So I think that uh, and I believe that we will go beyond that goal. Uh, I think it's our purpose. And we can assume that national and local collaboration in matters of civil protection was reinforced with the Make Cities Brazil campaign. And it was just possible with uh, the visibility to the city's good practice in the national context. Um, well, and this showed the level of the commitment and the work capacity that exists between national and local level. Uh, and the fact that we are here in Matuzingos, uh, I think, is a good proof of collaboration between all the levels, international, national and local. Well, um, we all know that local level is the first uh, level of inter intervention to build more resilient communities. We know, uh, too, that uh, cities are facing a lot of uh, challenge, uh, for example, uh, ensure better preparedness, efficient relief and rapid recovery for uh, of the communities in disaster events. And uh, the resilient campaign brought a set of solutions uh, and guidelines for working on resilience in communities. If we have a more resilient cities, we have a more resilient country. I think we don't have any doubt about that. Well, uh, in the Mendy King Cities Resilience campaign, uh, uh, the challenge is support the cities. Um, for example, in Porto, I think joining process is not a very huge problem, but it's a challenging uh, process just to empower them and give the tools for planning and implementation. Regarding this, the national level has promoted SEFTO initiatives, developed awards, publication on good practice in cities, promoted thematic workshops and guaranteed the involvement uh, of the cities in the definition of national strategy for DR. Well, finally, I think we can conclude that uh, this, all this energy has allowed very relevant results for the country and the Portuguese cities in the, in the campaign. I think the secret of success is working together in the different levels to the community building. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carvalho, for your presentation. And we heard till now from different government representatives on their experiences building resilience. But to build resilience, cities need access to resource. To implement resilience, cities need access to funding. Now I'm pleased to welcome Mrs. Priscilla Negreiros from Climate Policy Initiative and the Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance to tell us more on what is available out there for cities committed to becoming more resilient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Luisa. It's a pleasure to be here, unfortunately, online, because I would love to be in the beautiful city of Matosinhos. It was very enlightening, actually, to, to hear all the city officials from Dushaben, Barcelona, Central Bosnia, Canton, and Amadora. Um, so before I answer your question, which I think is a, is a very important and, and always a bit tricky one, I want to just to tell you a bit about CCFLA. So I manage the Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance. It is a multi-level and multi-stakeholder coalition aimed at closing the investment gap for urban climate finance projects and infrastructure. The Alliance actually uh, is led by Climate Policy Initiative, and we are very, very happy to be a partner of MCR 2030. So the Alliance includes public and private financial institutions, government, international organization, NGOs, and also city networks, and actually most of the organization implementing projects with uh, cities today. So we have around 75 members, and we aim at providing this platform to convene exchange knowledge among the, the, the mo most relevant actors. So I think... I, I heard, uh, I think it was Luis from Amadora, also from Barcelona, the importance of having these hubs, and that's exactly what we do. So answering your question, and finally, what are the options for cities to, to finance their adaptation and resilience projects? And I think very briefly, just for us to have a, a panorama, uh, we have, um, and in terms of source of finance, uh, we have first, of course, um, funding that comes from the public funds. So public funds can come from municipal, state region, national government funds. We know that municipal governments, and I think um, you know this, of course, better than me, have funding uh, comes from gen uh, revenue regeneration from variety of sources. So utility fees, taxes, bonds, and others. We have seen in this area some 
slightly more innovative instruments such as land value capture and bonds, which some cities are actually starting to use and, and are often, but actually often require higher level of capacity and technical assistance. We also have state, regional and national governments that also utilize a range of financial instruments directly to transfer funds to municipalities or provide funds uh, such as that infrastructure funds. And, but actually apart from the, the funds, the public funds that we know well, we have also international public finance, which, are, which is very important. So mostly, mostly coming from development finance institutions, including public banks, multilateral development banks, such as the World Bank, EIB. I know that in Europe, uh, the European Investment Bank is quite active. Um, this, they pose some challenges because a lot of this money has to come from national government. So actually, partnering um, with the central government, it's often needed, uh, which can be sometimes a real challenge. And they can offer in terms of public uh, international funds, so grants, project level debt, uh, market rate debt around and other types of um, uh, financial instruments. And finally, we have the private sphere. So if we go that way, so it covers a range of sources of instruments, uh, commercial financial institutions can offer opportunities, institutional private investors, private insurance, corporate actors, among others. And of course, they represent particular challenges. As we know that many cities cannot raise private capital, but we think and we know that uh, to actually close the, the big gap that we're going to have in terms of investment for urban climate finance, we will have to have the private sector acting more and more. And we can see a lot of different options in terms of uh, financing urban climate projects, but many cities are not aware of these possibilities or don't have the capacity or the enabling policy and regulatory environment to utilize such instruments. So what I wanted to talk to you about in the last couple of minutes I have is to highlight some instruments and some projects that can help cities to have access to this finance. So the first one is actually touching uh, based on project preparation. So many cities face major challenges in identifying and developing financially viable low carbon climate resilient infrastructure projects. This is particularly true for adaptation and resilience uh, projects. Uh, projects that could be at the same time attractive to public and private financiers. So the preparation of what we call in this area bankable projects at the subnational level requires often higher degree, degree of technical and financial uh, engineer capability that often cities don't have. So we have a group and a lot of different organizations that offer project preparation facility assistance. Um, so they support on concept design, scoping, sometimes pre-feasibility studies, feasibilities, or even in implementing some of the projects. But the big challenge is a lot of these PPFs are not actually easy to find. So CCFLA and the Alliance, we have created a, a green city finance directory, what we're gonna call now the project preparation resource directory, where actually cities can uh, look for information by country, by sector, type of support, project stage, and identify this project preparation facility. So I invite you all to go there and to, to check out uh, which project preparation facilities are working in your region. Um, very quickly, I want to also to talk about the GAP Fund. So while there's a shortage in project preparation support for climate infrastructure in cities, we also identify a gap in early stage project development. So basically, a lot of cities, they have ideas, they know what they want to do, they want to implement, but they have some difficulties in actually designing the early stage project. And this was something that we heard a lot from project preparation facilities. And then that's why and when the GAP Fund was created. So it was launched by Germany, Luxembourg, and in partnership with a lot of different organizations, um, the World Bank, uh, EIB, uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors, C40, GIZ, ECLE, and also uh, the City's Climate Finance Leadership Alliance. And the idea is to support projects in pre-feasibility stages. The GAP Fund has expressions of interest from cities on a rolling basis, so I definitely invite you all um, to check and to actually uh, go try to get some support for the GAP Fund for your project. And I'm going to stop now because I think I, I'm out of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla, and you can be sure that we will. We will look for it. Um, 
I'm, and we are delighted to see so many organizations gather to offer finance service to the cities. We really need it. So we will now move on with the discussion among all participants. If you want, uh, all the audience is invited to share their questions on the Q&A tab on Hopin. But to, for starting, I would like to pose a question to Mr. Wolfgang and to ask you, as a core partner of MCR 2030, how is ECLE supporting cities in building resilience within the initiative? Can you sit a few tools and resources? Thank you. Two minutes. You have two minutes. For your <laughs> well, I can go on for hours. No, uh, thank you for, for giving me the word. No, I mean, um, ICLE is, of course, uh, engaged for, for many years in the topic. And, uh, you know, we have gone through a large number of research and innovation uh, projects and processes and have developed a number of tools that we are going to share. And we have already agreed for the first semester that we, um, you know, focus on bringing in our expertise on uh, nature-based solutions for climate adaptation and building resilience. So this will, um, you know, uh, be upcoming and we just also bring along, of course, uh, you know, the partners uh, that can also contribute to the topic and we will continuously, you know, of course, bring our knowledge and expertise um, to the platform and um, will, of course, jointly, uh, you know, shape uh, these, uh, you know, capacity building measures. I mean, this is mostly, of course, currently done in the form of webinars, but we are clearly committed also to expand that in, in the midterm to a more also, of course, uh, you know, response to demand, basically, approach so that, that the cities that are participating in the Making Cities Resilient campaign can also, of course, flag their needs and their gaps in terms of knowledge uh, where they need support and the, so that we can, of course, also bring a more targeted response, you know, which is based on the demand and the needs of the cities participating. Thank, Thank you, you, Mrs. Teubner, for your answer. And I would like, now like to go to Barcelona for Mrs. Harris to ask her, uh, one of the main challenges of building resilience is the fact that we usually work in silos. Ares, how do you manage to work in an integrated way in Barcelona to mainstream resilience in different areas of the government? Well, thank you for, for posing the, the question. Um, I think it is, it is indeed challenging, mainstreaming resilience and stakeholder engagement. And it's actually a very important piece in the building resilience uh, process. And, and something that has been present since the beginning, since we started working in 2009 with the, with the resilience board. It has always been at the core of, of our model and, and of our continuous improvement process as we understand uh, resilience building also in, in a very proactive way. And this has been based in, in creating the governance bodies and also the, the instruments and the spaces to make sure and enable that this uh, collaboration is possible with uh, internal agents and, and across the, the organization of the city council, but also uh, engaging other actors that, that have also uh, competencies and jurisdiction in, in the city of other levels of administration from the public sector as well, but also in the, in the private sector. And uh, more recently, actually, we have just created the Municipal Resilience Committee. This is the current um, form of the, of the board. So this is the last evolution, the last up to now. So we'll probably uh, need to readjust it in, in the future. But, but we just relaunched the, the committee, which is, um, which is a governance body at the highest executive level. It is led by the municipal manager. And all the sectorial uh, managers, the, the economy uh, manager, also the uh, infrastructure management and urban planning and, and environment, the social services, uh, civil protection. So all of them are, are involved in this, in this committee. Also the territories, so the districts are, are, will be progressively 
engaged in, in the world. And uh, so, yeah, we have created this, this instrument because also the, the, the pandemics uh, shown that we have the instruments for the immediate response, the crisis committees, the, um, the cabinets for, to enable the coordination amongst the different areas to, to respond uh, for, the, for the crisis um at, at the when, when the when the when the impact hit but we but um what the municipal manager required this time was well we need to also make sure that once the crisis has passed we all the knowledge all the experience what what we have learned is not is not lost and that we also find the space to have these discussions at, at times of peace so so to say so that we can maximize these learnings we can also um implement um, whatever improvement proposals or things that we found that maybe needed to be readjusted or needed to be in, improved, that we have the space in order to be able to, to talk about this, discuss about this, and also make possible to make decisions and to carry on uh, to this, this resilience, this proactive uh, resilience building projects. So yeah, it, it is something that is that is very very important, and I think this this instruments, this commitment uh, that work within uh, within the organization and in order to mainstream resilience are are really important. Yeah. Thank you, Aris, for your answers, and we will like I'd like now to go to Mrs. Zenave and to ask you about Bosnia that has been facing intense floods on top of other escalating social and political upheaval. How is the canton tackling these challenges? Yeah, um, last few months, maybe I can say last few years, uh, we have a complex political and uh, social situation in the country. But here I have to emphasize that on a cantonal level, uh, we have a, so far a really good political cooperation between ruling parties. So uh, despite such a complex political and social uh, situation, the cantonal authorities of our canton managed to respond on needs of local communities uh, and continue with activities within their competence in all segments of DRR. So th th that is my answer. I'm not a polit politician, <laughs> so I won't talk about po politics. And here I would like just to, to use my time to say that uh, uh, for our government is really important to be involved in uh, MCR uh, campaign uh, because we uh, think that a cantonal level be, uh, can be some kind of a focal point for other municipalities in our uh, canton so we can in a way uh, help them and guide them in the uh, conduction of uh, MCR uh, policy. So, because only if we work together, we can achieve a lot. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, it's very true. Now we'll go further to we'll go to Luis, to ask Luis uh, about uh, the situation in Amador. Amador has been a role model city in the previous MCR campaign. And we, kept, we keep learning about the initiate, innovative approach to risk you have in your municipality. We have today many sem smaller and medium cities joining us. What would be your advice to a city starting this resilience journey? Well, it's a difficult you. question. <laughs> well, I, I will be short. Um, I think the first step we should be, uh, well, should define the city a realistic uh, implementation strategy for the uh, I think that's the, the biggest step. Secondly, I think um, we should just to um, explain to the community uh, the benefits of the part of the campaign, because I think it's fundamental to involve all local actors, the stakeholders on this. Uh, otherwise, I think we don't have so success with this campaign because 
If you use the argument that saving lives uh, with this campaign could be very powerful uh, when the, the cities are joined join this, I give uh, well the perspective of Amadora when we start in 2010, because we joined the campaign since the beginning of this process, we, uh, we took just two years to um, explain to the uh, stakeholders the benefits of the campaign. Otherwise, I think we didn't achieve any good results uh, because uh, we should empower the stakeholders, we should just involve them on the strategy at local level. We have to create a relationship input-output with them. We have to give something to receive something to. So, um, for example, we, we completed the U score, the Disaster Resilience Scorecard in, in our um, municipality it was very challenging because it's a, it's a system with 100 indicators. So we need a lot of information, we, a lot of data. Uh, if we don't have this collaboration with the other stakeholders, it's impossible just to complete this because uh, data is vital to establish uh, measures and um, uh, capacity to decide. So I will I will um, will finish my my intervention just saying that I think that's two things that we should think about when we join. The first is the involvement of local actors uh, in the resilience strategy. Secondly, I think leadership. We're talking about always all the time about leadership commitment are important. Um, but I think we should just have a mix very powerful at local national level between political, operational and technical. We should just working on the, the same vi vision on this just to collect good resu results and uh, good experience at uh, different levels. Thank you, Luis, for your uh, good advices. And we, I like, I'd like to go now to Priscilla again. And Priscilla, I would like you to give us an overview of how much finance is available for cities that are building resilience. What are the main challenges cities face accessing these funds and how to overcome them? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor, for your question. Actually, um, in the mid uh, 2021, we launched a study that was trying to do answer exactly this question. So the state of uh, cities climate finance uh, report. And what we have discovered is that we have a total of $384 billion that were invested in cities globally in average per year in 2007-2018. And this is pretty much far below what we need to in terms of investments, which is around um, some estimates say $5 trillion uh, annually. And if we just try to, to think on resilience and adaptation, so most, uh, I would say even more than 90% of this amount is invested in mitigation activities, uh, while um, adaptation activities represent 9%. So I would say uh, that account for 7 billion from the 384 billion. So we don't, we, we know, and we know it globally too, not only when we talk about cities that if we, and we have discussed this a lot during COP, that adaptation and resilience need more investments. And I think we have some challenges uh, as you, and answering also your question on why uh, this investment is not coming. Um, I, I could say some institutional finance and also knowledge uh, challenge and, and starting by the institutional barriers. We know that governments and municipalities are unlikely to finance their infrastructure demands themselves. It's it's um, a lot of cities have budget restrictions and high levels of that, which means that they cannot have access to external finance. We know that many municipalities lack of the technical capacity to prepare long-term uh, infrastructure projects and even have those plans. So as I mentioned, uh, working with project preparation facilities is, is very useful. Often we see too in the institution as an institutional barrier, their international public funding needs, and I think I mentioned this before, to go through national government. So this limits the ability from cities to receive direct finance. Some other challenges that we, we, can, we can talk about more in terms of the financial uh, sector would be that access to finance. And I would say not only private finance, but sometimes also international public finance is limited to the low rates of credit worth 
sickness from a lot of cities. So the World Bank has a, an interesting study that indicates that less than 5% of fi the 500 largest cities in the world is actually credit worthiness, uh, credit worthy international capital market. And this, of course, poses um, some difficulties. It, there is also, of course, the lack of investor ready bankable projects, as we talked, and cities have much larger needs um, to support sometimes than necessarily to, to work on their uh, climate and resilience programs. So, we definitely need to, to see this kind of leadership. And that's why I'm very glad to be here and hear so many uh, cities talking about their resilience programs. And finally, I think in terms of knowledge barriers, we see that private investor in a lot of uh, times lack of the comprehensive understanding of sustainable urban infrastructure. So they lack of innovative financial instruments that could help cities and be available to them. Uh, sometimes the scope of infrastructure projects can be uh, mismatched with the administrative boundaries of cities. And of course, we know that the COVID pandemic has exacerbated m many of these challenges. So let's, I, I was quite negative talking about challenges. So how to overcome that? I think uh, in general, I th in, and this is basically our mission, we need to make cities a priority. Um, I think we, we have been repeating that also throughout COP and all of them events and, and to the stakeholders we work with, we need to talk more about cities and their role and their importance in this climate change and uh, resilience debate, which is going on uh, for a couple of years now. We need to build awareness of cities' finance needs. We have uh, national governments, and institutional investors, donors. We need them to elevate their commitments and amplify their actions. Uh, we are seeing more and more of this happening. And I think CCFLA, UNDRR, and a lot of uh, different actors are trying to, to do that, and this is very important. We need the private financial sector supporting uh, new scale and existing investment solutions. So something I was going to mention before, but I didn't, like the CPI has a, an innovation uh, lab where we try to develop innovative financial solutions. So the idea is that we incubate uh, financial instruments and ideas of financial instruments that we can help to tackle climate change and come to a net zero economy. We have, we are we just opening uh, now uh, calls for ideas and we're going to have one specifically on zero carbon buildings. So this could be an opportunity to, to create a new financial instruments to help in the sector. Well, and finally, we need, uh, we should aim to support cities to help themselves too. So capacitate and work on, on knowledge so cities they can uh, solve these problems and they are very much capable of doing that. So uh, I hope I have answered a bit of your very, very hard uh, question. Thank you. It was a very hard well, question, Priscilla, but you answered it very well. We understand. And some information that you left that's very important about this call and other things. So now we have a question from the audience. The question is for Mrs. Zanada. And so I'd like to ask you, how has the assessment of resilience in the canton helped orient next priorities of action in your resilience journey? We have just joined the uh, MCR uh, campaign uh, this year. So, uh, in a way, our uh, risk assessment is made, is out of date. So, we are hoping that uh, through the MCR journey, we will find new ways to, uh, to uh, improve our risk assessment uh, and uh, here I have to mention that uh, uh, while we were uh, uh, fulfilling the uh, score, ass uh, score assessment card, uh, we uh, immediately saw some gaps in our old uh, risk assessment. So we uh, are really uh, hoping that we will uh, improve our risk assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Zanada. I believe this is the final question. Mrs. Mr. 
the, pres- the participant from Kurzawistan has to le- leave her before, Mr. Kurbanzola, he apologizes for that. So now we are closing this session. I want to thank you for your participation, for your presence here, and to the people who are joining us online. It was once again an honor to stay with you. And now we go further to the closing ceremony. Uh, Have a nice day. And I would like to tell again how much proud we are here in Matuzinhos to host this forum and to receive you all here. Thank you.